What's up, y'all? This your boy JT, the bigger figure, aka Fig Panamera. And I'm in apartments with Parlay, man. I need y'all to meet me in apartments, man. Come turn up for show. Hot boy, no, man. Y'all know what's going on, man. Meet me in the apartment with Parlay, man. We live in the apartment. Hey, Parlay. Meet me at the apartment. <laughs> Yo, this your boy Parlay. And we're in the apartment with Parlay. Meet me in the apartments. Listen, I love Atlanta. Y'all hear me hear y'all y'all hear me say it every time. But y'all know the only thing I love more than Atlanta is the west side of Atlanta. Shot the bankhead. Rest easy, shot low. Rest easy, buddy, aka we fly. Listen, man. The city is special. Cause I'm telling you, man, you meet so many different people who swing through that motherfucker. And then every blue moon, you 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 attach yourself to somebody who that you meet from somewhere else. You like, I fuck, I fuck with his vibe. I, I, I fuck with him. I fuck with how he move. You know what I'm saying? Because everybody know how it is when you like, when you from a certain part of town, niggas have the, the, the mentality, A1, day one. So niggas don't usually really fuck with people who ain't really from where they from. You know what I'm saying? It's only rare ones who say, I fuck with real niggas. I don't give a fuck where you from. You know what I'm saying? So my next guest, it's a person that I met down here. You know what I'm saying? Just fucking with how he move. He fuck with street niggas. You know what I'm saying? And we connected when we had a bun. And I just seen how real he kept it all the time. And I don't know what it was so different about us, but some niggas would be like, I don't really fuck when he do this. But I'd be like, you don't fuck with him, but shit, shop kick this shit 100, man. Oh, what the hell you doing wrong? You know what I'm saying? Then I go to find out just all the contributions that he done made to this game and to this music industry. You know what I'm saying? And I really don't feel like he just got his um his flowers before. You know what I'm saying? Um, one of the reasons I think he ain't got his flowers is because he gonna stand on this shit and he don't give a fuck how he feel, how you feel about it and what's going on, how you feel about what the truth is. You know what I'm saying? Anytime you stand on real shit or you stand on, on certain principles, you be an outcast. You ain't cool to niggas. And a lot of niggas don't like being not cool. You know what I'm saying? So it, it turned a lot of niggas who be, who be some quality real niggas who got a real nigga background, but they turn to the other side because niggas don't be want to stand alone. And ever since I seen him and learned his story, everything he done done, he don't stand alone. OG in the game, triple OG in the game, done turned on some of the biggest rap moguls and entertainment moguls that we done seen right now. You know what I'm saying? Started big way with a big lot of artists. You know what I'm saying? Um, been pioneering a lot of shit when it comes to this music and just teaching the game and what it is and really giving a free game. Know what I'm saying? It's like them. I like to. I like to uh, compare it to the commercial, where nigga be telling you to, goddamn. You know, you see the commercial at nighttime. Be like, call this number. And we'll tell you how to flip the house and this. And you be like, man, that's bullshit, man. That shit. But if you get them books and really study that shit for real, nigga, it really teach you how to do that shit. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the same thing. You know what I'm saying? So I like to welcome my next get to the show, the motherfucking legend, JT Fig. Pan of motherfucking mirror. Fit Panamera. Fit Panamera, man. In the apartments, man. Slide the mic up a little bit, dog. You can see yeah. back. Slide up some more. Pull it up. Okay, come on. Okay. Yeah, pull it up. Yeah, pull it up dog. Hey, hold back, on, dog. man. Yeah, okay. Man. What's happening, man? Hey, man. Welcome to listen. Fit supposed to be on this motherfucker. One of the first five people who's supposed to do do this shit when I first started this motherfucker. And I think it's. I've been at what is it like now. I started in like June, July. So I'm almost like at 10 months or some shit now. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But I just feel like I don't kind of got the platform prepared and ready. Got their ears warm enough to be able to receive stories like this and how real shit is like this. You yes. know what I'm saying? Yes. Um, like I say, I forget how to, I forget how to, exactly how the first time we linked up. But I remember, I, but I remember how we really connected. And it was in, we was in the West End at the Shell gas station. I was just going to say, at the gas station. When we linked up off a phone call, like, meet me here. Facts. Facts. Yeah. At the Shell gas station. Yes. Right at the West End. Right by the Popeyes. Yes. We took that goddamn picture. You know yes. what I'm saying? Then we just start locking in. And I would see Fig. That then he'd be talking that shit. But I'm touched by God. Nigga, I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm moving on. Give a fuck how you like. I'm like, this nigga slap bad crazy. <laughs> I like, I like he slap bad Come crazy. On. You know what Real I'm saying? Shit. But then I see him doing shit like coming to the projects, passing out a hundred pieces. You know what I'm saying? 
and not just doing this in one project. He might pass out 500 pieces throughout the day. 500 in this hood. Go to the west side, 500 in this hood. Go to the south side, 500 in this hood. Go to somebody, 500 downtown to the home of the people, 500. I'm like, that real nigga shit. And home ain't even front of that motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? So then we got the talking, got the rapping and shit. And he just start telling me all kind of shit he done done. And I'm just like, and I'm one of them niggas like, shit, nigga, you say some shit to me, I'm going to Google, I'm finna go find this shit out. I start pulling this shit up, start saying, look at these credits. I listened to this whole mixtape and read that name a million times. Oh, shit. Oh, oh, he did this. I started saying, oh, now I understand what's going on. I understand why he is how he is. I understand why he's so aggressive. Why, when, when a nigga say something, why he's standing on this. When you go through so many shit, it turns you into a certain type of person. So we're going to tap into all this shit. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying now? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What I want to do is, Fit, I want to start back to... When you was a kid, you know what I'm saying? Before you got a teenager, you know what I'm saying? Because I always just feel like, like, I know all these things of you and it helped me better to understand how you are, you know what I'm saying? I want people, I want my viewers and my listeners to understand the same thing that I understand. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? And I want them at the end of the interview to be like, no, I see why now, you know what I'm saying? So let's go back to where you from and where you was raised at. Now from San Francisco, Fillmore District, that's the west side of San Francisco. Born and raised, Mount Zion Hospital to visit Daryl. That's uptown in our hood. But my mama lived in Martin Luther King, Eddie Street. So they kicked her out the hospital the next day after she had me. And my first day was in the projects. <laughs> Literally within 24 hours of being born. And uh, my early days, man, it's project life. It's apartments and then it's projects. So San Francisco is a small city. It's like a micro uh, New York in terms of some of the building structures and having tall projects. And uh, my father was from OC Projects, 12-story jets. My mama was from Fulton Street. Not that they was gang members or nothing, but this is the blocks that they, you know, that they grew up on. And then here I come, you know. So I'm learning both angles of my neighborhood up close and personal. And then I'm looking at the music game as I'm growing up. You know, uh, of course, moms and them playing all the, you know, cameo and all the Marvin Gaye shit, the Michael Jackson, all that. But the rap game started when I was about 10, like hip hop. I think I was about eight, nine, 10. And it was a news report that officially came on television showing young black, uh, children spray paint their name on the wall or break dancing. Yeah, it's this new thing called break dancing and, and sweeping America. And uh you know, run DMC as a earliest thought of some rappers, LL Cool J, my earliest thoughts of some rappers that being in, in elementary school and looking at the way music was impacting me, it was in 88, I was 14, mm-hmm. and they have a place called Pier 39, downtown San Francisco, and it's an amusement type park. But for $20 a song, you can go in this booth, and they'll give you the lyrics to any of these rappers that was on the list. I remember uh, Run DMC, Will Smith, Parents Don't Understand, and I remember spending $20. I spent $40 for two songs, but the man let me keep recording. If I, He was charging me by the hour, but I'm like, shit, he like, if you finish, then you can go ahead and do another one. So I'm like, shit, I'm finna run these two hours. And I was 14 and I remember making six songs and I remember making copies of my first six songs to sell to somebody who wanted copies as a kid. So, um, and that's only because of MTV, you know, seeing rappers and shit on TV and Russell Simmons and Adidas deals, niggas, you know, niggas had Nike uh, Adidas deals way back then. The shoes is out. The, the girls like the clothes. The guys, you know, the dope boys got it. Being young, wanting it, infatuated. But I always knew music was part of money. I don't know exactly how I was going to make it, but I always knew. Watching Run DMC and them, how they became millionaires off some damn songs. So I, I think that was burned into me early. What what made you what made you say 
I know motherfuckers want to know the lyrics to a song, so I'm finna sell them to them. I think when you say lyrics, when you say you was wrote, you write the, the lyrics down to the songs, right? And you say you were selling them to motherfuckers, right? <laughs> nah, at the the lyrics, the lyrics to the songs is what the studio people sold to us. Oh, okay. So if you want to be this particular rapper, they would let you do the song and make you a little video and a tape. Oh, okay. So they they letting you. Be, you know, for be the choice. artist. Okay, be the yeah. artist. Like some karaoke type shit. Some karaoke shit. Okay. And right. get, but instead of me using their lyrics, I use my own lyrics. So you made your own video. First time ever freestyling was in 1988, and I paid $40, and I got six songs down, and I put my homies' names in it. A few of the homies was in there. So, of course, we just talking shit. We rapping. You know, we letting the clock run out. He, like, put on another song, so I did them six. And uh, selling them right there, Gave me a little spark of, man, I could be a fucking rapper, man. Shit, what the fuck? I'm out here stealing cars. I'm out here selling dope. The shit ain't really working as a kid. I'm. It's like you going to jail. So the music, um, it just became a nigga infatuation. You did your first mid tape in two hours. <laughs> two hours and forty dollars as a forty. Man, I would never ah. spend that money. I would never spend forty whole dollars as a kid on some damn studio time. But I remember. Going to the pier, it was mostly tourists that was doing it. I never seen a rapper really want to use a fucking place where it just got a mic booth, a microphone like this, some headphones. You know, they got the speaker outside, you go inside the booth. But for a kid, to me, I'm like, nigga, I want to be a fucking rapper. I don't know why. You know, well, I just think the whole hip hop thing of seeing rap music, the vibe, you know, Growing up in the rap game, like as soon as this shit started, you, you know, you was you was of age to under, really understand I exactly, exactly. Just like a twelve year old right now know little baby, or even an eight year old probably know little baby, or maybe a five year old. You know, they don't they, they, they don't drop now for real. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah the yeah. shit then went down. Now you could be younger and fall in love with this shit. So, you know, um, I think all of that play a part in it. Just them early days. And seeing how the game is where it's at right now, but how it started, it's just a pure. I want this shit. Like when you see Run DMC with a fucking donkey rope on, and or LL Cool J had the, the Kango hat with the Adidas sweatsuits, and like man, the only niggas who had that was the Dope Boys. But if you could be a rapper and get a record deal, you know back then you think all oh, you thinking is a record deal. I need a record deal so I could get my chain, get my this, get my that, get my car. But, yeah, I need to get a car. I need to show people I'm the man. Okay. But you might 360 your soul away for the hate talk about. Was it any uh, was it any um, record labels or studios or artists at, the, at this time in the in, in, San, in San Fran? Huey MC, one of our founding fathers in Fillmore. Shout out to him. Rapping Forte, another one of our founding fathers from my neighborhood. Um, Huey MC had a DJ named DJ X One. He had a house studio. And then another guy named J Mack, he had a house studio. But them the only two people. Well, there was maybe one other person or two other places, somebody from different parts of, of our city. But back then, in the beef, you couldn't go over there. Because it used to be a beef, you know what I mean? So that beef shit, oh, right on, bro, appreciate you. Yep, uh, that shit died down in 92. And then more people, you can find out that it was more studios actually in the city. That it was people in other parts of the city, but it wasn't no social media, so how the hell I know about you? Yeah, so people got something going on in they part of the city, but you don't really know what they record they got no studio because we don't listen to y'all music because it's, it's shit going on. So we only really know of these guys right here where we stay at. So. Ain't no way to know that anybody else had anything. So it's really basically them, them, just them two guys. That's no it. But for my knowledge, the table right now. for my knowledge, for sure. Um, but I just follow with the older guys. You know, whoever they said, I just followed that. Like you know what I mean. So when they was like UMC, I would see him in the neighborhood. But he actually had uh, a eight track or sixteen track. You know, he actually had something to record with. 
So back then, the only the only way you can think about a record deal is somebody put you in a studio. You never thought that you could spend your own money for your own studio. That wasn't popular back in the day. Mm, mm. Until people start making money, and people like, oh shit, I could start a record company and sign me a rapper or get you know, give me a producer, buy some equipment. I'm running through these bands anyway. Let me let me spend some money on something that we might can really make it. What was the big, what was the first big record label in uh, in the Bay? Um, Two Short 75 Girls in my era. As a kid, the first record label I could think of that had something that was uh, moving was Too Short, a label he was working with called 75 Girls. 75, 75 Girls. And you know, Too Short, you know, he used to put everybody's uh, name and the lyrics. And then when he put the tapes out, he would put all these different names and that, that was a way where he could get some sales by putting popular dudes' names. He can go talk to the, the dope boy or the, the guy with the job or whoever name he would put in there. So that record label became popular, but a lot of other labels was doing their thing. Also like IMP Records, that's Cool Nut from San Francisco. Gotta give him his, his credit. Um, I would think that there was a lot more labels that I could be able to name, but I really didn't start respecting this shit till we had our own record label. What was the record label? My shit was called Get Low Records, 1992, June. That's when I said I don't want to sell dope no more. I don't want to do nothing. I was 18, and I'm trying to. I'm, I'm going for the gusto with music. That was 30 years ago. Well, did you start it? Was it just you, or did you just have some more people who started started the label with you? It started with me as an idea, but I was motivated by people like my boy D Mo the youngster. I was I was motivated by rapping Fote. You know, people that was already had their rap name going, but I knew I had to get my own name going. And the only way to do that, I gotta I gotta I gotta step it up. So from the age fourteen, by eighteen I was like, fuck it, I gotta take it serious. Cause if I'm eighteen now, you going to prison now. Ain't no more boys camp. Ain't no more group homes. Turn 18, your ass going to prison for them same crimes you was just doing. So music became like my only option. Like I knew getting a job wasn't going to work for me, but I was willing to work a job. I just couldn't get one. So being independent, it became like my only option. I ain't had no option, man. Record these songs, press up some copies and sell them. Back then, Selling your tape. If you had some, you had something to sell. The average dude wasn't going to press up no copies and no tape. You know, so I pressed my first 500 copies uh, in June of 92. And it was six songs once again. And them six songs, uh, them six songs was something that um, put me on the map because I, I just followed Too Short Formula by putting all the people in my neighborhood who was somebody. Who you talking about? <laughs> I put all their names and that shit made, it made so much sense because automatically it gave me a shot at all the, all the main factors that uh, I named was shot callers throughout my neighborhood. So I went for every part of my neighborhood to put names of whoever was somebody. When I did that, I instantly became famous in my hood. If I wasn't famous, Soon as I dropped that tape, I was famous in the hood. You want to see? You want to tape? You want to tape crazy? I went tape crazy, man. I pressed up my five. I pressed up five hundred copies of my cassette. Wasn't no compact disc back then. It was only cassette. Or you record. had to actually play the shit and let it record. Yes, you had the whole sir. shit. You had to do that five hundred times. Yes, but at the manufacturing plant, they had a machine that can okay. do it. Yes, more high speed. But at the house. With me and the homies, you just got to push auto dub, and you could buy a little recorder, a tape, a tape deck back then with two, two uh, uh, tape decks. You put your blank over here, and you put, you know, whatever you recording. Some of them you could high speed. But back then, you had to let the whole uh, project play. But to make five dollars per tape, or seven, or eight, or ten dollars, and you only spent a dollar or you know, a dollar fifty or something back then for a cassette tape. You wasn't mad at that. 
that's where people selling compact discs right now and how mm -hmm. people were selling DVDs or CDs, bootleg or not. A lot of people got rich off that. Because at one point, that wasn't popular to be able to buy a product that you made in your fucking house. Right. And then go make copies, and now you don't even need no job. You just made some thought wilds. The person that job maybe made 1500 2000 a month, maybe 3000 a month. You know what I mean? For somebody who getting some money, right? Mm -hmm. That's considered money if you get $3,000 a month. Facts. If you make 2000 guaranteed, 2000 going to be in your account on the first. Any part of America, you kind of doing good. Hell yeah, yeah. You can make something shake with two bands. Yeah, especially back then. You know what I mean? Especially back then. With two bands? No, nah, especially back then. So if you could press up your cassette tapes and make two bands over a two-week period or even a week, Maybe you at a basketball game, you do even better. You in the parking lot of the projects, you you can do good. Why you the only nigga out here with cassette tape, man? And you got niggas' names in it. it How was, you was doing the covers, the the, the the fold cover that go in them? It was a fold cover. My homeboy, we, we used Polaroid. <laughs> my nigga took the picture. My first photo shoot is with a Polaroid. Shout out to Demo the youngster. Demo the youngster took my first pictures. Nah, that was too hard. Uh, and my cover was black and white. Oh, that was that was too hard. And my cover is called Putting It on the Map. It was called my name was JT. But my partner was like, if I was you, I'd call myself JT, the bigger figure. If I was you. And I looked up to him. So he said, he said, if I was you, I'd call myself JT the bigger figure. I'm like, damn, that's cause I was looking for a name. Yeah. I'm like, damn, I just can't be JT. I gotta put something with it. So he gave me that. So I ran with it. As soon as I put that on my black and white tape, I knew my career started because I got a name that I ain't never heard nobody call themselves bigger figure, none of that shit. So, you know. So listen, I'm gonna ask you this right here, right? What age was it when you bumped into Master P? I was 18. I was 18, 1992. Yep, I was 18. And um, my first tape, after the one I put out in June of 92, I put another one out in November. It was called Don't Stop Till We Match with JT the Big Bigger. I got booked for a show in Richmond. Master P was fucking around in Richmond at this time. He was living there. He was booked on the show. I'm booked on the show. A bunch of other people booked on the show. Long story short, we come over there. Some other guys from our city, San Francisco, get into it with some guys from Richmond. But the problem didn't end when the, when the other guys from Frisco got up out of there. But then we still there. So we inherited somebody else's beef. And at the show, uh, when I got on stage, Master P and them niggas came through the door about 300 deep. They had a field day jumping on our heads. We was young niggas. And we was outnumbered. <laughs> we was outnumbered. Yeah, now nah, we was outnumbered. Yeah. You know, and, I, and I like to give Master P and the guys from Richmond credit. Jumping on JT, the bigger figure. Demo the Youngs, the San Quentin. <laughs> My nigga P, Skins, Proper D, Ken Dog, all of us, nigga, we all got beat up. But that's come with the game, dog. Shout out to Master P. Then two years later, I was on fire in the bay, and he had to call my phone, and I, I, I squashed the shit. He said he had some money for me, so I'm like, I don't care about y'all niggas jumping. You got the money right now. He said, I got the money right now. I said, come to my mama house, my studio, my mama house in Fillmore. And uh, yeah, that was that that right there. I think I was 19, finna be 20, something like that. Master P, I did his first uh, on his first album, The Ghetto Trying to Kill Me. So if anybody see Master P first album, you see my name at the top. Yeah, yeah, JT, bigger figure. Yup, yeah. All yep. right, there, about yep. it, about it. Yup, I put I pushed the line. Cause you know he wasn't popping in the bay yet. He was still growing. You know what I mean. But when I stamped him, they're like, oh, okay. He was gonna stamp himself though. Let me be clear. I'm not trying to say like I stamped him, but I taught him 
independent game from the way I understood it by dropping a bunch of tapes, by putting the album covers on the inside, what distributor to use, what company to use. I signed the priority of 95, that was one year later. And that was April 13th, Master P signed April 17th because it was a distribution deal. It wasn't a sign as an artist deal, you know what I mean? But P definitely had a lot of wisdom. I was a young nigga with the game. But wisdom and game is two different things. Game is uh, a talent that you have. Like people say, I got game. Okay, that's knowledge. That's anything you know how to do, that's your game. But on the flip side of that, wisdom is the ability to take your game and turn it into something. That's what wisdom is. Wisdom is what Master P had possessed when we signed to Priority Records. He had wisdom of what to do with it from a bigger perspective. And what I had was game to get me to the deal, but I didn't have no manager. I didn't have no backup. I didn't have no other brain power but my young 21-year-old mind doing the best I could using my game, the independent game. But when you go major... It's a different ball field. It's a different playing field. It's a different platform. Major have bigger expectations. They have bigger uh, requirements. I mean, I don't know what the deal is like now, but I pretty much was a young nigga with a major deal but didn't have a staff. You know what I mean? Imagine you got to, like, I really had to hire my mama to help me. I had to hire my homeboy mama to help. I hired a couple people that I knew in the neighborhood. But these ain't people that is in the industry. These is people that I just know. Yeah. Just because you get an office don't mean you a business. Facts. Is that is that is understanding that what kind of drove you to continue to stay in the independent game, or what made you just say I'm gonna stick with the independent, even throughout all this this shit happening. You seeing these deals happening, and you seeing what hip hop started at, and then now you seeing guys from the projects who really saying that you really go get these deals. What made you just stay focused on the independent side? Um, I think, boy, it's got these African lips. Mm. Yeah. I don't need too much on my shit. Huh? Don't. If he still would, he gonna come in and talk. He could come in if he. Come on in. Yeah, yeah. It's the real we straw right here. Man. Yeah. What's going on, dog? Yeah, man. Right here with the JT bigger figure, man. Which is telling you how he linked up with P. You know what I'm saying? Um, cause I remember my first. I remember my first. I remember. Somebody told me that I he didn't tell me this. Somebody else told me this, and I and I'm a fan of like I'm a fucking fan about it, about it. Like nigga in my era, nigga like that's the one of the first gangster shit that you know from top to bottom, right? So I look at this shit. I'm like, oh shit, he is on this motherfucker, man. So that's why I just wanted to figure out, you know what I'm saying? It's just how y'all linked up, and you know what I'm saying? What type of part you played, you know what I'm saying? And, and making that shit, you know what I'm saying? Shake mm-hmm. it happen, and how you end up getting on 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 the tape. So. You was producer and doing music at the time. Yeah. So what what made you say what made you say I want to start producing? I think me having to wait for somebody to make my beats was part of my biggest thing that made me want to be a producer. Because um seeing people like DJ Quick and Ann Banks and you know uh Dr. Dre, you know, actual real producers, I think Seeing that and seeing what type of power that it brought. Like me being a rap artist, I think that's that was something that was my initial, my initial uh goal to push just me as an artist. But then when I seen if I learn how to make beats, then I could be more even more valuable because I like beats, but I would show love how to make them myself. So I had to start really studying that shit and practicing, you know, and everything I learned. I was able to start making my own beats in real life. What'd you start making beats on? I started making beats on the SP-1200. <laughs> what the fuck is that? That is a drum machine, and you used to have to go get an old record 
and sample it and you loop it, then you could put the 808 boom or the clap or the hi-hat. So it wasn't like high tech how it is now with Pro Tools and, you know, computer uh, programs. But going from a SP-1200 to uh, modular keyboards that have sounds in it. So now I can, not only can I do my drums and do some samples, now they got these new things called rack mount keyboards where it got piano, it got bass sounds, it got any type of sounds that you could think of was in keyboards. So I started mixing them two together and then I just stopped sampling because they say if you sample, you can be sued for that shit. So I just started using the keyboard samples, I mean uh, the keyboard sounds and, and mixing uh, the SP-1200 with them keyboard sounds and then Back then, we had 8-track, then it went to 16-track, then it went to 24-track. Of course, you know, coming from the hood, we starting off at, at the 8-track level. Uh, they came out with something called ADATS. And then, God damn it, once it went ADATS, I started feeling like I was Dr. Dre. I thought I was Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, and Suge Knight, all in one. What about, what about, what about, uh, about what year this is? Around about the same time, 93, 94? 93, 94. Yup, 93, 94. What was your what was your first moment in the game where you were just like, yeah, nigga, I'm here, like, yeah, like ninety four, oh, okay. ninety four when when I put out ten albums from my mama house, and then I had all them record labels calling me for the money, and I was like, nope, I don't want to sign no three sixty deal. I knew this back then, like, nope, I need to own my name later just in case. I don't know what the fuck gonna happen, but I just know I can't sell my name right now because every record deal came with they own the name. They own you. You give up some of your publishing. You give up your masters. You give up your copyrights. Once I learned what them three things or them little few things was, I'm like, hold on. So if I give up my copyright, then I can't do this. And if I don't own the master, I can't do this. So signing as an artist, that was out the question. And then Priority Records came out with a blueprint to still be able to sign us, but just our own label distribution. And at the same time, Atlantic Records did that with P. Diddy. Mm -hmm. Gave him a million dollars. No, Arista Records, I'm sorry, Arista. For Biggie Smalls, for Craig Mack. Um, Master P took a little more money than I took from Priority Records. I just got manufacturing distribution, not guaranteed marketing, but some marketing assistance. Master P, was able to get a few more hundred thousand where they gonna come in and get behind radio. They gonna get behind um, uh, the marketing. Like he have a certain level of marketing, but they gonna bring it on the bigger scale now. Where they gonna go ahead and get behind publicists. We gonna get you on TV shows. You never saw that with me because I never signed that part. I only got manufacturing distribution. So he was like, well fuck it, I'm gonna go and use their marketing plus my marketing. And then run the bag up. Do you think? Do you think you do you do you look at that situation and say, you know what? I'm glad I did it like that. Or, damn, I might I might should have took that. When they offered the money, it kind of scared me a little bit more because I was listening to Minister Farrakhan and I seen what happened with Ice Cube. And remember, it's all about dangling some money, and then you assign some, but then your long term effect. You might be feeling like Megan Thee Stallion. She famous, but she don't own nothing. <laughs> that shit crazy, boy. Yeah. Listen, but it's the 360 deal that you signed that puts you in a position where you could be upset when it's time for payday. Because you yeah. could be famous, but your bag might not be right. So I don't think, I think, I think that whole situation was for Master P. As much as I was there, and I might have played a part even helping him get there through my efforts of showing him the marketing that I was using and stamping his music and bringing him to our studio and, you know, making him part of the family from that perspective. He left the Bay and literally moved back to New Orleans, outside of New Orleans in Baton Rouge. That's where the setup was at. He ran the play that was from the Bay, but down south, though. That's called multiple products. Once you get hot, do not take your foot off the gas once you get hot. That's what I did in the Bay. 
That's what made the labels come like, okay, JT the most consistent label. He just dropped all these he new dropped artists. He dropped 10 of motherfuckers. As a kid, I'm, yeah. I just turned 20 years old, and they like, damn, he's making this shit in his mama house, and I'm starting to mix it myself. I'm doing everything myself. <laughs> that was a moment in time, though. As time go on, you can miss your wave. Mm -hmm. Me being an OG in the game now, I understand waves. I understand moments. I understand capitalizing your moment. When this your moment, you gonna know, but you can't play with it. Now, if you're not even pursuing your moment, that means this your big break. That means this your first big meeting. That means this your first big check. These is elements that make a young nigga have the desire to be like, oh, I seen that nigga make it before. I know them niggas was struggling. Now look, them niggas on. To any young black nigga who got music dreams, He's supposed to be saying, nigga, I know I can make it. Fuck that. I yeah. just watch these niggas make it, but I got to stay out of jail. I got to stay alive, can't get killed, so I can't be the on the most dumb on the most dumbest moves. I got to know I'm valuable. But a young nigga might not hear that. Like me saying it right now, some young nigga watching this, yeah. this young nigga right here. Hey, boy, if you know you worth millions, nigga, and you know your music just as good as the next nigga shit and better. There's no way in the world that you're supposed to throw your life away as a young black man with, with million dollar talent and the whole hood know you got talent. Nigga, everybody know, and then you just throw that shit away. I, think, I just think in a lot of instances like that, it's just that a lot of people don't have the same drive as other people, but that don't mean they don't have ambition. A lot of people just need direction. That's why I like these podcasts. That's why I like to have people like you on here. So when a nigga hearing this shit, like, Shit, JT did like that. Oh, you didn't need nobody. Oh, he did this and his, and he did this and he did this. Oh, this shit possible. Like you saying, oh shit, I, I could do that same shit. You know what I'm saying? Let's go to a, uh, let's go to another milestone because this is another milestone in 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 the, in the history of hip hop. All right. Mm -hmm. Tell us how you you piped up or started or created Black Wall Street. Well. Before there was the game, <coughs> before the game, Daz Dillinger from Death Row Records, Dog Pound, came to the Bay. He was doing something up there with a couple guys. So I seen him. Like, hey, what's happening? Woo, woo, woo. I'm going to do some music with y'all. Got some money. Cause he was there to make some money, but when I see he didn't have a lot of money and he was hungry for some money, I'm like, ooh, this a platinum rapper right here, nigga, up here in our fucking area. Let me see if I could put a play together right now. I know a nigga that just tried to do a deal with the dog pound for a hundred thousand cash, but the dog pound and the outlaws, both of them turned the shit down. But it was a hundred bands. I'm like, damn, nigga, you just said you needed some money. This nigga got a hundred, like, nah, we're gonna get more. So, whatever play happened with the dog pound shit, I seen Daz up here by himself, though. He didn't have corrupt. I say, nigga, I've got a nigga right now that'll give us 50 bands, nigga, for, for the project with 10 or 12 songs with me and you right now. And he was just selling verses for 400, 500, whatever money he can get. He like, Nigga, he can get the money right now. He got the money. I say, nigga, all we got to do is record it. I give you 5000 right now, nigga, as a deposit, and this nigga going to give you the other 20000 And I'm going to get my 25000 So we just finna, I know a nigga going to sell us the beats. He going to sell us the beats, what, 10, 12 beats. The nigga charged me like 5000 for that. So I'm like, get this nigga five, get dad's five. When we did them 12 songs and that niggas gave us that, them 50 bands, that nigga pressed them copies up immediately. After, he, after me and Daz counted the money, the next day he damn near took the songs to go print them up so he can hurry up and start getting to the bag. When that happened, niggas like, Daz went to the bay and hit for some money. Because now he back again filming some shit with JT. So JT just showed Dad some shit that he could have did on his own, but he didn't know that he can go print up his own shit, and he didn't know a nigga in, in the bay. Somebody will buy your fucking album. You don't got to be broke. Nigga, if you talking about you need some money, like, man, I'm ready to do some songs. I'm like, nigga, I know a nigga with some money. After we did that, then I'm like, 
I know somebody else with some more money. This time it's a hundred thousand. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, talking about. Like, hey, Fee, you still got that nigga dead? I'm like, Dad, stay a few more days, nigga. We gonna record these songs and just cash out, nigga. Them niggas can have the fucking pride. I don't give a shit. I just want to get my fifty. Okay, so listen, I'm gonna ask you straight this. up, and that's I, how that's how the game situation. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, Fee. Hold on before you keep walking. I, I just want to ask you this. I just want to, I want to be able to follow you mentally. All right, you know what I'm saying? What the fuck made you say, we got to do it instead of, okay, let me just turn him on to it? Because he turned down the 100000 when, when my man said he wanted to do a, a Dog Pound album, he got a 100 bands, and that nigga Daz was like, I need some money, but no, I don't want to take that. So then I looked at the same nigga like, damn, okay, how can I get in on this? Because I got this nigga Daz number, and I'm finna go up here and go meet this nigga while he in the Bay. He was in Sacramento, I'm in San Francisco. So nigga called me like, hey, Fig, the nigga Dad's up here. I'm like, send me the address, I'm on the way. So when I go up there, and I seen he was hustling, which is cool, I didn't look down on him or nothing. I'm just like, you turned that honey down, but I know. Oh, this how I can get in. Oh, you hustling, you want this for some verses, but I got a nigga who'll give us way more of this. Than right now, add up, nigga. But you gotta get me in. Fuck this we shit, We gonna nigga. record it, nigga, and I'm gonna pay for the beats and the studio time, nigga. You ain't gotta put up nothing. Why? Because I know this nigga got the money. Bam. Little that play. nigga showed me some money like, hey, Fee, I'm trying to get in the rap right game. Right now. Boom. I'm trying to get in the rap game with a big name. I want to sign somebody or sign something. Got so the I money. I couldn't give him the dog pound, but I brought him. But you bought him dad's, dad's got the L.A. Bigger, bigger, long beats to film Fuck you talking about? Cash money. Yeah, you talking about, okay, boom. So that right yeah. there led you up to the 100000 Then, Then high roll it to it. Okay, so that's 1999. We just do the shit, all right? 2000, boom. That's when both transactions take place. It's in 2000. 2001, I dropped this shit through Bayside. February 14, 2002, <coughs> I meet the rapper The Game, who already familiar that my name buzz in L.A. Because this nigga got a fucking album with JT. Like, who the fuck is JT? But shit, JT knows some shit. And JT's an artist, too. JT executive producer. JT a playmaker. So he knew them elements about me. And when I'm like, hey, bro, I want to bring you back to Filmo, bro. Like, I think you dope as fuck. I think, nigga, I can... Put a play together with you. You that dope nigga. So I fly game back from Compton to Fillmore. This after the Daz Dillinger shit though. So in LA, my name ringing even harder like, and these CDs hard, and we got some hard shit. Oh, okay. So when I meet this nigga, the game, my name in LA already have a certain level of elbow room. Mm -hmm. So by me discovering him, telling the whole world, this the next nigga for the West Coast. And he really became that. So the game shit is just an extension of what I did with Daz. I think it's an extension of me and Noble from the Outlaws did an album called Street Wars together. That was before game. So I got the Outlaws shit, and then I did something with Juvenile. Me and Juvenile had a little project together, too. Yeah. Who you sold that to? <laughs> Shit, I forgot. No, we got some money though. No, real shit. Juvie was happy. No, and Juvie and Juvie fell out with Birdman. So when he started his own thing, I'm one of the first customers. I'm one of his first customers. Soon as he was on Double XL, Juvenile no longer cash money, right? Or he leaves cash money. When he go independent, he already like JT. I know all about you, boy. Nigga, the whole New Orleans already knew about you. That shit that was going on with Master P, we was listening to P shit, but we was listening to your shit because you the one, y'all niggas together. So it was like an introduction to New Orleans because P became a big dog in New Orleans and throughout the world. But everybody know, okay, that was through JT line, though. Because before that, before that album, he didn't have no presence. With Ghetto trying to kill me with my name on it, the first one, that's the first one that kicked it off for him. The next thing kicked it off for him was West Coast Bad Boys. Mm -hmm. He put everybody in the bay. But he followed my blueprint of me putting everybody in film on one project, like a super group, not like we Wu-Tang and no shit like that. It was just... An introduction me, to all the niggas who put doing their shit. An introduction. 
And in Unity, as Filmo, it was able to be something like, okay, this nigga JT just put a mastermind play because you went and got niggas from every part of the hood and put everybody on one. So my nigga Herm, Lewis, he did that in San Francisco. Like, okay, JT just put all his hood on. I'm going to put the city of San Francisco on. And then when that dropped, Master P seen both of our projects, and he said, nigga, I'm finna put nigga everybody on the bay on. Or at least, you know, he's going to go to all the cities. But P had a bigger bag than me, too, though, because he was still a brick boy out there. You know what I mean? So I'm like, nigga, I don't got dope boy money. But he like, nigga, I got, you know, the ice cream man. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he was able to take that, and then that's what gave him so much power. And as soon as he got the power, he left and said, I'm going back to New Orleans. And took the game. Boom. I'm gone. I fucked it up. Yeah, I'm back in New Orleans with yeah, you. Talking about yeah, it. yeah, I'm a super, I'm a superhero in New Orleans because they don't know none of this shit, JT. So I'm finna run that same JT blueprint, but I'm finna do it through New Orleans. So but he get his own credit. I can't say I'm I gave him all that. It's just the part, the part you played, and that's why I'm saying that's why I'm just trying to explain to people too how many, how many times in the, in the history in this game that you done played a part in helping somebody on their path. Like that ain't no small shit. People don't meet People don't meet famous people. Nigga don't even meet famous nigga. Uh, uh, let me not say it like now, because you in Atlanta, you, you fuck around. You said they got a gas station. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. But other than that, like back then, you didn't, niggas didn't meet famous niggas, uh, let alone help somebody famous get into position to do what they doing. And you done that this numerous of times. You know what I'm saying? So I just wanted you to speak on that. How the hell did you end up moving to Atlanta? I moved to Atlanta through two people. My little brother Zaytoven, who I taught how to make beats, and now he's a, you know. Oh, so you taught Zay how to make beats too? Yes, Zaytoven. <coughs> I bought Zaytoven his first MPC. Mm. Bill Mo, San Francisco, 1999, right before he moved. His mama moved here. I'm the one taught Zaytoven how to plug up Pro Tools. I'm the one taught Zaytoven. Remember I told you about my drum machine? Mm -hmm. I gave Zaytoven his first kit of drums. That shit you hear on Gucci Man, all that's the first shit. That's the JT kit. He brought it to Atlanta and created wow. the whole sound. If you watch any Zaytoven uh, interviews, they say, "How you got started?" My big bro JT man. I was playing keyboards at the church. Plus, he went to high school right there, so he was playing on the, in the. And band. you heard him playing in the keys, and you I said, "Oh him. shit, I can't play the key. This motherfucker, come here, come play the key." Whole part about it. A girl I used to like. Uh, okay, she's a girl I like. She go to church. I know her mom, her dad, I know her whole family. But she always bragged about this dude named Zay Tobin playing at her church. But she was trying to get me to come to church. But I never actually went to church to, to go with her. I liked her, but I was like, damn, I don't think I should go to church though. Like, like you know what I mean? And then the guy that she kept talking about. I seen them at a football game, and they was playing ludicrous, bitch, get out the way. But he was playing the keyboard, and somebody was on the drums. And you know how the band do their thing. But then they went to another song, but it was the same dude playing. I'm like, damn, who the fuck is that? And somebody said, that's Xavier. That's his real name. That's Xavier. And then, okay, whoo. I said, he raw. That's Wanda Friend. Wonder friend. Oh, yeah, the, the church genius. little homie. So the nigga with the two hands going up and down the keyboard, I say, man, I gotta bring him to my house. <laughs> hey, you talking about? I gotta bring him home. I say, bro, I want to meet. He like, yeah, I already want I've been trying to meet you. I'm like, damn, okay. So I brought him to the house and I just showed him he already had the music talent. He just didn't know that he didn't need a whole band. <clears throat> he didn't know they got keyboard sounds where you could got a piano, a flute. A bass, you know. And you can do all this shit yourself. And all you need is the drums to go with it, and then you need to know how to use Pro Tools. Because after you make it, you gotta put it in the Pro computer. Tools, and then you can down. plug your mic up. And now you your own studio. So I was with him for one whole year at my house. We made an album called Some Crucial. I'm on the drum. I'm doing co-production. He playing keyboards. We just collaborated. But that's our first, that's his first album that he ever had something to do with. But it's like coming to Atlanta, he always would say, JT, 
man, what you doing in the Bay? You could do it out here, bro. Like, Atlanta's like, they love the rap game. The rap game is alive and well. You know what I mean? As the Bay Area was dying down because of uh, the, the Bay Area died down with a lot of the record stores, right? But meanwhile, Atlanta had their own CD burning business going. In the Bay, you cannot have a store with no CDs burning. But when I came to Atlanta, when I... Two dollars. Oh, your conversation in the background. Um, yeah, Atlanta, Atlanta. Um, when I seen, you know, my brother Zay Tobin, like, bro, you need to do what you did in the Bay. You need to come out here and do it. I just think you you gonna do better right now. But I, I was there for all the shit with Gucci and the, o, the OJ, the Juice Man's, and you know a lot of the big shit, even the Shop Boys. Uh, up through there or something. Like, imagine I'm around all this shit, but I'm not really tripping on the movement like that. I'm really tripping on, I'm really here visiting, I want to make my impact, then I'm going back to California. Never thinking like, why would you want to leave if you got an opportunity to come to a place like this? And you got your little brother Zay Tobin who going to introduce you to everybody. It was a no-brainer. Then my other homeboy, he was, he was buying the houses in West Side Atlanta. That's how I ended up on the West Side. He like, yeah, man, I'm buying these houses. They don't want them. They out here for selling them for $12,000, $14,000, ugly little beat-up houses right here. So I've been buying them, Jay, and I've been putting some money into them, just a little bit, and then I'm selling them or I'm renting them out. And I'm out here in the Bay struggling, paying $2,500 for some rent. When I could come to Atlanta and be paying this nigga a thousand, I don't care if it's a trap house in the hood, I don't give a shit. You sure goddamn did? <laughs> nigga, I'm moving. I didn't know I moved to something called Bankhead. And I don't know I'm walking up these little, but man, I was in some of the most deadliest spots. Yeah, the hell you were. Moved over here, but to me, it became home sweet home. I ain't going in front. This shit, as deadly, as deadly as the West Side is, the, what my nigga Nut used to say, uh, the Wicked West. I did not know how deadly it was. Like, for whatever reason, I'm so hood that I'm going where the worst shit at because you, this is where it feels you, most comfortable. Now, you could tell, you could definitely tell that you just didn't really, you can tell. Because niggas don't move around the city like that at all. You know what I'm saying? Niggas be like, this nigga over there, what the fuck, this nigga don't know over here. This nigga over here. Yeah. Over here, this nigga over here. Over here. Yeah. I remember one time, um, Fig had the, um, the homies in Four Seasons. You know what I'm saying? And um, you know, if you want if you wasn't if you wasn't what they was, you don't go to four seasons. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So <clears throat> fit you go out there, fit you like I say, fit go to all the project, pass out pieces, take mamas to motherfucking Walmart, tell her fill the grocery bag buggy up, pay for everything. Like I done seen this shit with my eyes numerous of times. You see what I'm saying? So I'm like, yeah, I fuck with them boys. You know what I'm saying? So we got them. We put some shit together one time where we got all the homies from the west side, from one side, and we got all the homies from their side. And we got two big ass tour buses, and we got them came to the club. You know what I'm saying? Where Rick Ross is there. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Put a big play together. Everybody seen everybody outside. It's awesome. Oh, no, we ain't going to do this. And we talk, what y'all talking about? Nigga, we chilling. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That was another pill for the point, landmark point, especially in Atlanta. You know what I'm saying? Especially at that time. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Because niggas weren't moving around like that. What made you just start coming up with ideas just saying, you know what, I'm just start going to the hood and just doing shit, passing out food and helping period get clothes and shoes and socks and shit like that? Um, in my hood, that's what I did. I got the idea <clears throat> for Minister Farrakhan say, lift your people. If God bless you with something, you really, it ain't just for you and your wife and kids. Actually, when you get blessed, he actually bless you with enough. You can help more than just your wife and kids and your mom and them. Like, a portion of that belongs to your people. It don't have to be nobody who asking for nothing. It's just your portion that you're supposed to put something back into your people beyond just your family. So, the reason why he was saying that, he was saying, this is the way that you set yourself up and your family up so that when you're going through something, you already paid some in advance. It ain't coming back from these people that you looked out for. 
it's gonna come back from God Himself because you put it back without no string attached. Like this, your people. You don't love your people. You don't want to help your people. So being stingy is something that can fuck your whole career up. Being stingy, you can cut your feet off by fucking over a nigga who help you get on. Then you fuck over him thinking that this this deal, I'm finna cut this nigga out. Or I'm finna slime him on this deal. You know, because I'm here now. I don't need this nigga no more. And then you mess around and cut your own feet off. Well, you should have just kept it solid. You know what I mean? So, um... It's just a lot. It's a lot that I learned moving here. Just coming to you, bring it, bring the shit you're doing, like you, like Zay told you to do. Same shit you were doing. You can come down here and do this same shit. Man, do the same thing. And I knew that I owed this neighborhood. I owe Atlanta. Like if ain't no other nigga came here and benefited and told the people the real, hey boy, nigga, if you didn't come to the A, nigga, and we didn't push a button for you, nigga, you would not be where you at right now. I don't never want Atlanta to ever see me like that. Like. I was a nigga that came down here to try to get on, but I don't got no real work out here in the street. Like, that's why I was so public. Like, why JT always giving back out there? JT say he owe everybody. <laughs> Fuck you mean? Because I came here broke. Nigga, I ain't no nigga came here with money. I moved to Atlanta broke with a wife and two brand new babies down there. Moved into the West Side Bank here on Mark Trey right there, paying my homeboy $1,000 a month, and I came here with 2000 My rental car was about 600 I had about 1400 left. I didn't even know about which store to go to. I ended up going to Target, spent another damn near 600 on buying just the cleanup shit for a house that you got to clean and, you know, move your family. But I just never forget. I came with 2000 nigga, and I told wifey, I don't know how we gonna, uh, I'm going to have to tell this nigga I got to pay the rent. I can't give him rent money right now. I can't tell him I only got two bands. But nigga, I came here, nigga, and I was Mandatory Business Magazine. I never forget. Mandatory motherfucker. Nigga, I knew business. that I was a magazine. So did you started it, you started Mandatory Business when you got here? Nope, I was already doing it. So I had a little buzz already, and Mr. Two Official had went to all the hoods already to make some copies. And I said, go take pictures of all the hood, put niggas in the magazine. So I sent him the copies for free. He could sell them, do whatever he want. But that's how the magazine broke in Atlanta because he went to the real hoods. That's why I knew about them hoods when I started making movies in like the Four Seasons or the Hamp or Ethel Ridge or the Night War. It was because he had already went through and talked to somebody and took pictures. So when I got here, I knew my camera and these copies of these magazines is the way I'm finna find me a nigga out here in Atlanta to buy a front cover for me so I can get some rent money. Buy a two-page spread, buy a goddamn a quarter page because I have a tangible magazine. And once niggas seen they hoods in there, that made nigga want to be in it. Bingo. And I tell a nigga, I'm the CEO, nigga. I'm the director and the cameraman. The motherfucking bay guy. Nigga, and I got, boy, I, I wanted to tell you, and I got a wife and two kids around here, boy. I ain't got no job and I don't sell dope, nigga. This is my only money, my mouthpiece and this camera, nigga, and these magazines, nigga. That's how I started making my first money because I couldn't come here and steal nothing, finesse nobody, jug nothing, none of that, nigga. That's why I said older hood, nigga. Feel more Atlanta. Feel more Atlanta. West Side Zone 1. <laughs> come on, nigga. West Side Zone 1, nigga. These is the people that got behind me. And gave me opportunity. Niggas could have ran me up out of here if they wanted me up out of here. Nigga like, nah, nigga, give this nigga a chance. Nigga, shit, he fucking with the real hood. He really coming out yeah, here. Yeah, you are. Especially when yeah. niggas weren't really doing that, not not moving around. What? Why? I want to ask me this, too. Why do, why do nigga people, the people that do feel like this, why do people dislike you like that? I think to them, it's a moment of, I should be doing this, but this nigga doing it, and he going out his way doing it, and it's energy behind it. This ain't no camera scheme. This ain't no goddamn photo op. This is a long time activity that can be traced back to the Bay Area. In my movies, you'll see me with the homeless. You'll see me with the with niggas that don't, don't nobody want to fuck with. The broke niggas, as you would call them. I say it's more broke niggas than it is rich niggas, and it's more broke niggas that ain't on yet. So I think I need to make sure I stay connected with niggas that ain't on across America. 
no matter where I go, I gotta help some niggas that's trying to get on. I don't know how many days I got on this earth. All I do know, God had blessed me to meet people and something big happened. Straight up, the Zay Tobin, the, yeah. the, the Kevin Gates, the game, the masterpiece, the the, the uh, teaching people, you know, like the outlaws and dad's diligence. Come on, go independent. And then I'm part of their first sheet. Um, meeting the, the new young niggas that I be now, I be like, bro, listen to me. I know some shit. It's like I'm a nigga from Back from the Future. If you ever seen Back from the oh, Future. Oh, no, you got that guy. An old no, nigga come back in time telling the young nigga some shit about what's going to happen. And if you pay attention, nigga, you, you don't have to go through all the pitfalls that a lot of us have went through already. You know I'm going mean? to tell you what I think. I like, too, though. I like how you, I like how you stand on your shit, though. <laughs> right? And I like how you move. How you move and you pull up where you pull up at. Well, no pun intended. Even if it's a situation that you like, damn, boy, these niggas might really try to fuck me over. I done seen you pull up in situations. So I remember a personal situation we had where I was just like, I was telling my homies, like, yeah, I fuck with Fid, you know what I'm saying? They were like, man, fuck that nigga Fid, bro. We gonna fuck kill that, that nigga Fid. We see him like, Fid, the fuck Fid done did it, y'all. So you know, nigga get the sense. I'm like, nah, Fid ain't, tri man, hold on, let me hear Fid. I'm like, hey, Fid. <laughs> this is the crazy part about it, too, because I'm just one of them blunt homies. I just talk blunt. I'm like, hey, Fid. My niggas want to kill you, bro. What the fuck you nah, that's, really, that's what you told so, me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Fig, Fig explained to me what had to happen. And I was like, oh, you know what? I understand that. I was like, so listen, Fig, I'm, I'm going to get you. I said, I want you to pull up at my homie spot. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I want you to chop it up. Most of the niggas would have been like, fuck, nah, I'm not pulling up. Nigga would call on the phone. Immediately, he was like, shit, say less. I'm, I'm pulling up. You know what I'm saying? Pull it up and chop it up. And I seen how he came. No trip. Now, he had his fire in the car, and I don't even know Fig. I always pull up with a fucking vest on. But he left his shit in the car, came straight in there, no pills, no name. You know what I'm saying? I was like, it takes a certain type of nigga to trust a, a nigga, a person's word, and it takes a certain type of person to put himself in a situation. I was like, nah, I, I, fuck, I, fuck, I fuck with that energy. You know what I'm saying? Shit. You know what I'm saying? Real shit. Say, Fig don't care. The nigga said, Fig, pull up. <laughs> say, Fig, nigga say, Fig don't do what? Say, Fig, say, Fig don't, Fig don't pop the clip. What, 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 hey, Fig, what the hell done did? Yeah, man, the nigga said I, was, I couldn't do shit. I couldn't pull it back up on here no more. I was pussy or some shit. Had to show the nigga. I said, man, this nigga Fig got there. This nigga loose. I said, okay, Fig. I thought Fig was the goddamn, the, the play put together. I said, Flip, Fig done brought that goddamn film up with him. Man, that nigga says you got to get up out of Atlanta. Damn. I said, no, man, I know you ain't saying. That nigga like, nigga, I mean it, nigga, every word. Nigga, you gonna get up out of Atlanta. I said, okay. You stay right here, nigga. I'll be right back, nigga. And I came back in 10 minutes, nigga. That nigga said, nigga, shoot me. I said, nigga, I just want to show you, nigga, I could kill your ass right now, nigga, but that ain't what I want to do. <laughs> I pulled that nigga pants down. His pants were sagging. I put the gun to his face and pulled his pants down. Like, nigga, don't never play with me like that ever again, nigga. And I drove off. The next day, some of the homies from over there off Simpson was like, hey, bruh. Man, that nigga took about seven, eight pills last night, bro. The nigga went home, choked his grandpa, man. He in the hospital right now, man. He want to talk to you. I'm like, all right, put him on the phone. He like, hey, bro, I just want to apologize for last night, bro. Man, I'm glad you didn't shoot me, bro. I'm like, bro, nigga, I didn't want to shoot you, nigga, but you can't be threatening no nigga like that, nigga. And that was, uh, that was my introduction to the West Side. That was my introduction. They're like, oh, nigga, this nigga came back tonight. In front of the whole club. I wasn't no killer. I ain't no killer, man. I won't, I won't play like that. I just come from Fillmore, bro. Like, that gun shit is just as serious as it is. But that's nothing I play with, though. Like, I don't, man, I don't want, I never wanted that image. That shit for the movie. But I happen to happen to live it over here, though. Like, okay, this ain't no movie out here, though, nigga. Nah, for real, for you real. You might have to really go through this shit. Nah, talk about movies. Boom. 2012. I got. I told my man I'm gonna do a movie. He said. He said if you write it, I'll shoot it. I wrote the motherfucker. Boom. Tony, he talking about, but that motherfucker hard. Like, we gonna shoot it. Start thinking about niggas that I can put in a fucking movie. I was like, nigga, I'm finna put JT in the motherfucking movie. Come on with it. So we shoot them. The trap. Shoot the motherfucking trap. trap. Man, the trap. I told goddamn everybody was in the movie. I told them telling these niggas like, bro, we having readings, bro. You better bring your ass to reading. You know what I'm saying? 
every time we had read it, JT was at the motherfucking reading, man. Come I said, on. my dog, take this shit for real. Hell yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking I'm goddamn doing some shit, goddamn. So we shoot the movie, you know what I'm saying? Go out there to the nine, shoot some pre-scenes. Movie end up being the most classic fucking street movie come out of Atlanta. For come real, on, for real. man. Come on. Then I go to find out that this nigga was already doing movies, been doing fucking movies, right? So he like, shit, lay you on, make me you on, got them, cut me back up. So like a year go by, I ain't dropped the movie. He like, hey, man, what's going on? I was like, man, this, this, this going on, editing, you know, this got to do this, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He like, yeah, I understand shit. Say, like, you need to drop them motherfucker. Another year go by. Every time I see him, we talk about this movie. That nigga said, hey, lay man, you take it too long. I'm going to start shooting these movies again. My dog don't crunk the moves up. I'm like, shit, nigga, I'm getting in your shit, too. Come on with it. My dog say, but I'm doing it different, though, Lay. I ain't got no script. Ain't no script. <laughs> I'm just shooting. I'm like, Fig, they don't make no sense. You can't do it like that, Fig. You got to, yeah. they got to make sense, Fig. Like, watch it. Just watch it. Just pull up. I see my dog out there, got that, got that camera, man, nigga, shot that move, and that motherfucker went crazy. Then they thing you know, man, fit don't got that shoot, bottom run boot, burn, boot on, uh, dirt on my boots too. This movie got that Chirac movie in Alabama. I said this fit, fit don't went got that slap ass crazy with these movies. <sighs> Next thing you know, my dog don't start him a whole fucking website trap flicks. Come on, man. With How did it? With the tablets. With the tablets. Had to go. And to I still tablet. got a fucking tablet at home yeah, right like now. Come on. It's dead in the box. Come on. I think I got two of them bitches. Come on, man. I promise. It's classic. This is one of them motherfuckers I'm saying that bitch like them niggas sold that Kanye tape. Right. God damn right. That bitch for a million dollars, boy. How did you even get the idea to start traveling? it? Man, I want to give a shout out to Curtis Snow, man. You know, in his, his situation with the first snow on the bluff and the pain he went through with the ownership of that movie and the company, Netflix, actually using that film, before they got so big, that was one of the films that they had always had at the top. Mm -hmm. Something that you could watch and be shocked, <laughs> shocked for sure. And I seen that they played him. In 2014, it was a duplicate of my life in 1994. I put out 10 albums in 94 and got on the map. I was here, I said, ooh, it's like God giving me a, a whole nother, it's 20 years later, I can do the same thing I did back then, but do it in the movie game. That mean I gotta drop a movie every month damn near for the whole year, and I'm a, I should have my JT, the bigger figure, trap respect. 2014, I completed them 10 films. January 2015, I started trying to be my own Netflix, because they tried to give me 150,000 for 10 movies to be part of Netflix, and then that's all I get. I'm like, hold on, bro, I know it gotta be. But the middle man, he like, this is what the deal is. I'm pretty sure he's probably gonna just pocket. You know, I don't, I don't know what no Netflix deal is about. Mm -hmm. All I know, they said, for them 10 movies you just made going all over the country, you need to, we, we got 150,000, so that's basically 15,000, and, we'll and we'll do all the marketing and promotion. But I'm saying, what is the, what is the, the royalty rate, like how do you even, how is it even being monetized? Like where is the commercials at? I don't even see no commercials. So basically, long story short, I didn't want to get caught up in the 360 deal off the movies. So I said, let me try to start my own Netflix, a little low budget one, just for the movies I made. And that's, that was the, that was the idea. But do I feel saying, if you got a movie, put them on my platform. Yep. Got them subscribe every month. I got movies on there, all the black movies. You go on that motherfucker. Got them, you see, got them track flicks. You see the got them scrolling. You no, know, I was scrolling at the chat. Anything my boy did, I was fucking with my dog. Nah, real shit. I ain't gonna lie, I was you fucking with my dog, man. Me, bro. You help, you help. Yeah, you in help, all man. the vans, all the trap houses, all the way to Dixie Hill. Come on, man. All the way to Greenbrier. Come on, man. <laughs> Come on, man. I'm glad you were witness to. No, you know, for real. that's why I'm happy to just to, to have this conversation. You know what I mean? Like what Atlanta did for me. Like I don't know about another person's appreciation, but like I owe these folk out here. Like I gotta help with something that the people could say, yeah, we benefited off of it. Whatever God put in feed, yeah, we benefited. My dog feed. Straight My dog feed always gonna hit a lick. And I ain't never seen this man sell drugs. I'm telling y'all, man. Come on with it. And I just used to be like, what the fuck did I, he told me, hey, Lay, I 
like, just to play as a play. I said, this nigga a genius, dog. The hell to be able to take that game and to ride on the game. Most of niggas got game and don't even fucking really use this shit, dog. Did you hear what I said earlier about I had the game when I signed with Priority? Master P had the wisdom. And wisdom is what to do. What to know what to do with your game. See, we could have game, but wisdom is when you turn your game into some transactions. Like, nigga, my game work. Nigga, I just pay my bills. Nigga, I just hit me a, a play off a few <laughs> songs and bust this move and boom, boom, boom. <laughs> nigga, here goes some money. That's what the fuck we trying Listen, to do, nigga, pay some bills. Fig come down that motherfucker, you look up. Fig got a mid table with Gucci. Then <laughs> 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 you look up. Fit got me to me go. <laughs> but they there, they just they just drop all this. I'm talking about fit getting them meditate early. Early. Early in the game. Like this nigga right here, man. Before the world, before the world grab him, man, I know him. I see him in the hood. Let me do something with him before them niggas come get him then. Shout out to my nigga Lil Wee Straw, man. Hey man, we want to work with a star. Thanks. Before he be with them white folk gone. We got him right now. <laughs> he need somebody. Got yeah, that. my he man ain't, say he need, he need the best that. thing going. For real, for real, man. Nah, man, appreciate you tapping in, Fit, man. Definitely going to have to do a, do a part two. Now nah, we got two. I didn't know you was right here, though. You know what I'm saying? I'm so yeah, happy. I think I'm in the hood. Man, right across the street. This, I'm going to tell you for real. This kind of remind me of what you had across the down the street. I wish I could have got it going. I promise. And it's now it was that vision, that idea that you had, dog. I tried, you know though. Saying? I nah, tried. Real, I tried. But that was a kickoff nah. of a nigga efforts. Of what do you owe back to the city, Fig? Well, let me put a building like this right here. Come on, come do your shows. Come do the movies, nigga. Anything we can do. Because it's like, fuck it, bro. All gas, no brakes. We independent. We got to use God-given talent. God-given talent is what going to get you through a dark hour right now. A nigga don't have to steal and kill his way to the top. That might be an option, but imagine you already born with everything you've been looking for is already inside you. But if you don't get a chance to, to, to push it forward so the world can see, that means sometimes they got to sit his ass down and go get the recording done, get the filming done, get your pictures done, go talk with the lawyers. These is things you got to lead the trap to go do. These is things you got to lead the block for a minute to go do. Handle your business. Man, and then make it home each night should be every nigga go. Don't, don't plan it out by the months. Oh, I'm going to be doing this and that. Nah, this shit day by day, nigga. I'm taking my day serious. Why? I can't be lurking nowhere, nigga. I got to be somewhere where I'm supposed to be and then get to where I'm supposed to be. Stay on that path and don't let somebody else invite you somewhere off your path when this was your moment to take flight. That's what the message to my to my little bro right here, like, this is the moment that means something right now. Like, I'm fresh back from Africa. The, what's the chances of us linking like this? But we actually here, and we making fire, and look, it's lined up. My man's already next door waiting on us. So I say, damn, there was God playing. God so playing. the people who here participating, this ain't just no movie. This real life. life. Nah, this is real life. We trying to make it, man. This is special. So we in a moment in history. And this is another motherfucking milestone. In a little bit, we'll be talking about this same motherfucking situation this motherfucking second, man. Tell everybody where they can um, follow you at, Fit. Man, y'all can follow me at 1JT, the bigger figure, on Instagram. That's where you need to tap in with me at. And then you need to follow my YouTube channel, Traflix TV. And them is really my main two, you know, my main two things right there. But if you need to contact me, I forgot. Man, I got an American <laughs> phone number, 650-531-0646. I'm going to say it again, 650-531-0646. I don't have a secretary, but I got a metro. I'm back in America. And yep, I got my metro. And I, I can get a random call. It might be worth a million dollars. I learned this from back in the day. Hey, Shout out to Mike Jones. Shout out to Mike Jones. Shout out to Mike Jones. Man, it is. What the motherfucker is. Yeah. JT, the bigger figure. Yes, Fig, Panamera. This your boy, Parlay, man. We in the apartment with Parlay. Meet me in the apartment.